welcome to the second installment of the Howard and Sandra Bender Educational Series. For those of you just joining in, um, this series is the newest addition to the slate of existing educational programs and endeavors by the Maryland Horse Foundation. So those include our Maryland Thoroughbred Career Program, our Work Experience Program, and of course, the library. Uh, for this series, we've partnered with the University of Maryland Extension to deliver a set of four seminars over the course of 2023. They are all focused on interests relating to the equine and general agricultural industries. So this series is made possible um, by the Bender Family Foundation, University of Maryland Extension, our speakers, and you guys. So I'd like to give a big thank you to everyone in this room with us, notably Dr. Amy Burke, Jen Reynolds, um, our speakers Meredith Epstein and Molly Ballant. So we're incredibly lucky to be joined by Meredith and the Institute of Applied Agriculture for this seminar. Meredith has been teaching and advising students at the University of Maryland's Institute of Applied Agriculture since 2013. She teaches courses in agricultural business management and sustainability and also manages the University of Maryland Community Learning Garden. Through it all, she loves helping students learn how to grow food, manage successful businesses, and build careers as food system change makers. Meredith holds a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from St. Mary's College of Maryland, a certificate in ecological horticulture from UC Santa Cruz, and a master's degree in agriculture, food, and environment from Tufts University. She and her family own and operate a small farm in Burtonsville, Maryland. So Maryland, or <laughs> Meredith, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Flip this on. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to thank Becky for reaching out and making the connection this, uh, for this to happen this evening um, in partnership with the University of Maryland and uh, this beautiful library that I have to admit I didn't know existed until this speaker series. So I am very happy to visit it for the first time. Um, it's gorgeous and I am definitely going to be spreading the word about it. <laughs> Uh, so yes, thank you. I am Meredith Epstein, and I am here to give you a very foundational pep talk about agricultural marketing this evening. I actually teach ag marketing as a 15-week course at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, so <laughs> we're going to do it in 40 minutes tonight. <laughs> um, and I am a teacher. This is gonna be kind of like a class and I'm gonna expect you to participate. So just be warned, it's gonna be a little interactive. I'm gonna be looking to you for some, some discussion, some answers, some input, uh, but I promise it won't be too painful. Um, and my goal is to really set the stage with a very introductory um, session about agricultural marketing at large, what it is, how we do it, and set the stage for Molly to come up and really hone in on a very important piece of ag marketing these days, which is social media. Um, so I will not get into that myself. I'm gonna let Molly do what she does best. Um, and I'm very excited to speak with her tonight. Uh, I will give a quick plug for the program that I teach in. I'm at the Institute of Applied Agriculture at the University of Maryland. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, which is very possible, even though we've been around since 1965, uh, we are a two-year program at the College Park campus. Uh, it's kind of like Ag Community College. Uh, the reason it's housed at the University of Maryland College Park is because we have the world's best resources for hands-on teaching, you know, laboratories, campus farm, uh, research greenhouse, we have access to so many wonderful resources that community colleges really don't have the budget or space for um, when it comes to ag. And we all know how hands-on ag learning has to be. Um, so if, if you or anyone you know is thinking about college, maybe as a, something right out of high school, maybe as a career change, maybe as a career enhancement, we have nine different programs. And I teach in ag business and sustainable agriculture. Jeff Reinhardt is here with me this evening um, from our turf grass programs, including golf course management and sports turf management. Uh, and we also have several others. I'll, I'll pass these around. Um, we have our own admissions process. So you apply directly to the IAA with rolling admissions. You, can, you could apply this week and start with us in 27 days if you wanted to. <laughs> um, but you, you skip the whole, you know, 
big university admissions process and come straight to us. Um, so I'll pass these around if you want to take one and, and share. Thank you. I'll say there are no animals in the pamphlet. They didn't consult me uh, on that. <laughs> but I promise we have access to a phenomenal animal science uh, department and the courses. You're a University of Maryland student. You take University of Maryland courses for credit and um, it builds a transcript and you can continue on for a bachelor's degree or higher if you want. Uh, but I will get to the topic of the evening, agricultural marketing in a nutshell. Uh, I have some very basic definitions for you. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that we haven't all been you know, sleeping and eating and working ag marketing on a day in and day out basis. Marketing, I think a lot of people go to advertising first when they think about what is marketing. Uh, but it's so much more. It's a huge bundle of activities that is bringing goods and services from their production to our consumption. We're all consumers, right? But I know a lot of you who are sitting here this evening are probably here because you're also on the producer end of marketing. You create goods, you create services that you are then trying to get into the hands um, of, of customers, of consumers. So marketing is a many, many different activities that direct that flow. And when we talk about a market, we're not talking about like a grocery store or something like that. We're talking about the group of potential customers that you have that you can reach if you do it right. These are people who have common interests, they have common needs or wants, and they have both the ability to pay for what you're offering and they have the willingness. Because I could be able to pay for something, but I'm not interested in, in it. Or I'm very interested, but it's not accessible to me for some reason. I don't have the ability to buy it. So we have to find the correct mix of various elements to actually reach the, the customers and consumers that we want to. So when we think about marketing, you can think about the big, big, big picture where everything is flowing from production to consumption. In our case, we're thinking about what happens when something not necessarily leaves the farm in the case of a lot of equine businesses, right? Maybe things are happening on the farm. We're going to talk a lot about that tonight. Uh, but what happens between the, you know, origination of the product, whether it's a foal being born or a lesson being offered or training being done, and your final consumer. Maybe you have to bring them to where you are. Uh, the micro-marketing is more of what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm kind of moving us in that direction here with this discussion. It's the little picture. It's what's going to happen on the farm before we interact with our consumers. <clears throat> the marketing channel is how we describe all of the different businesses that something, we're going to talk about agricultural products and services tonight, right? How it moves from the farm to the consumer. And in the case of many equine businesses, and I'm curious to hear where you are working, where you're joining us from, the things are produced and consumed in the same place, right? Nothing's really going anywhere. A lot of customers are coming to you, but there are certainly segments of the equine industry where you do have to move products and services through some sort of channel to reach consumers. Uh, it's a little easier to think about this with uh, consumable, maybe edible products. So that's the example I'm going to use. Um, but just keep in mind that this flow from, from you, the producer, to the consumer is not just going in one direction, right? There's a lot of feedback, especially in more modern times. There's a lot of feedback coming from consumers and customers to us, the producers. They are reviewing us on Google, right? They are posting and sharing, checking in at locations on social media and pictures of what, you know, what your farm does are, are showing up so that their, their networks can see it. And it also doesn't necessarily happen in a straight line, right? We can maybe think of it more as a cycle that can go in multiple, or a wheel that can move in multiple directions. 
But I'm going to try to explain the marketing channel with the example of a box of Kraft macaroni and cheese. I have three small children at home, so Kraft macaroni and cheese is a very important part of our life. <laughs> uh, I was very proud of myself. Last night, I've, one of my kids is really vegetable averse. I pureed a butternut squash and mixed that into the mac and cheese with the cheese packet instead of the milk. Same color. Nobody could tell. It was such a win. <laughs> but where does the box of macaroni and cheese actually begin? How's it created? This is the class part where you talk. In a field, okay. All right, let's, let's take a step back from there. Soil. We can go back to the soil. Yep. We're actually going to go all the way back to the sun. Right, we'll get a little existential here. But yes, it's <laughs> right. It's, it's a farm field. We're growing wheat, but that's not the only ingredient, right? What else isn't out there in the field? Macaroni and cheese. Water. Cows. Got some. Yeah, we need some dairy cows. Yes, they. There's definitely a lot of water involved. Production of milk, right? And then somehow it magically turns into the orange powder. Um, no, this is, this is all in production and processing, right? So we have raw commodities, raw goods that have to be processed, um, very, very processed in this case, to turn into the neon powder. Um, the, the wheat has to be uh, you know, milled and turned into flour, which is mixed with other ingredients and shaped into noodles and all of this is happening right uh, in in factory settings in this case until you actually have it come together into the package which that's a whole nother story right the design of the package and the research that went into designing that package but we can't just go buy one box of macaroni and cheese from the craft corporation right it's going to get packed into a pallet and that pallet, along with many, many, many other pallets, is going to get transported cross-country um, and end up in a supermarket where, yes, I'm going to buy it at the supermarket, and then I'm going to drive it home. The thing is, I am not necessarily the consumer of the mac and cheese, although everybody knows that you take the first giant scoop with the mixing spoon when you're, before you serve it to your kids. Um, so, yeah. I'm not actually the consumer. So let me hop ahead. Customer or consumer, very important distinction. Let's look at these pictures. Are we looking at customers or are we looking at consumers? Yeah, they're, they're consumers, right? They're actually consuming the content. Does, does anybody get this reference? Okay, <laughs> Christmas story. They're, they're, they're gazing in the department store window. Um, yeah, Trix is not advertising to the customer. They're advertising to the consumer because then the consumer, who's about this big, has a lot of sway over the customer, right? These days, because these are a little outdated, I realize, um, a lot of that is happening here on a, on a smartphone, social media. But again, Molly's going to talk about that. Customers buy the product. Consumers use the product. And sometimes they are the same person, right? I bought my lunch today and I ate it. Um, but parents who buy the video games from the retailers are the customers, right? They actually lay out the cash. The kid who plays the video game is the consumer of the product, of the content. And so we're going to market very differently to those two audiences. So quick discussion, I want you to think about ways that you are currently marketing your products or services. Do you feel like you're targeting the customers or the consumers? And this will maybe I'll just ask for one volunteer. Um, what do you do with your farm business? Where are you in the equine industry? And do you feel like you're reaching out more to your, your customers who are actually getting their wallets out? Or the consumers, are they different people? Or are they the same people? Anyone want to volunteer? Yes, please. Thank you. I used to do a lot of equine stuff. I thought this was kind of versatile for ag, or whatever. Yeah. Equine's fine too because I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little bit here too, having just moved here. But um, I think with horse stuff, at least when I'm doing summer camps and they do that here, and um, little weekend things for kids, I have found it to be for both. And 
that, Miriam? Parents want to save. I need to market to them heavily. But the kids also want to say, oh, I want to go see horses. <laughs> so in that case, I think a lot of equine, if you're doing lesson programs or any of that, it's kind of dual uh, benefit from marketing to both. Yes. Have a little balance, you know, kid things and parent things. But to me, it's always been a combination for equine and stuff. Yeah, a summer camp is a wonderful example um, where you're, you're marketing to both the parents, the caregivers, the guardians who are going to pay for the camp, but you're also marketing to the children who are going to consume the content of the camp. Um, and, you know, someone who pays for summer camps right this very minute, I'm looking for something that's right, safe for my kids, it's enriching for them, it's going to allow me to drop them off before I have to go to work and pick them up after I get off of work, and the kids are looking to have a fun summer. They don't want to feel like they're in school, right? So <laughs> whew, my kids are going to camp at their schools. It's very tricky, very <laughs> tricky conversation. <laughs> and I keep calling it school too. So, um, but yes, so we have to, we have to be thinking about these two often coexisting sets of, of people and that they often require different messaging, right? And none of our products, wherever you are in the ag industry, you know, I'm, I myself, in case you probably could tell, you can like sniff us out, I'm not an equine person myself. <laughs> but uh, we do poultry at our farm um, and cut flowers. So uh, I'm happy to speak very broadly about agricultural industries. But it doesn't matter where you are. You are not guaranteed attraction to your buyers. You have to really work for it. <clears throat> it involves just as much work, as far as I can tell, than being out in the field. It's, it's just as big of a job. You really have to earn your position in the marketplace and consumers are gonna continually tell you how that's changing and what they want. So we really center our approach to marketing around what we call the four Ps, the marketing mix. It's four basic marketing strategies that work in tandem together to create a specialized mix for a specific piece of the market, that's all of the potential customers that are out there, that you really are going to zero in on. We're going to call that your target market, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but the four P's are product. It also means service, but we just call it a product, right? Product, price, place, and promotion. And this is from the producers, the farmers perspective, right? The consumers have a different perspective. The four C's, we'll call it. Uh, customer, cost, convenience, and communication. So they're, they're analogous, right? The product, they're really like, how are you focusing on me, the customer? What are you delivering to me? What's the value I'm getting? The cost, yeah, what, so the price for us, we want to make sure that we're, you know, making a, a reasonable margin on what we're, what we're selling. They, they're more concerned with minimizing the cost of what they're buying, right? The place, the convenience for them. How can they access it? And then promotion would be communication. How are we communicating with them effectively? So we're going to dive briefly into each of these four Ps since we're more on the producer end of things. Um, and then we'll look at some real life examples. First, product slash service, but you know, to make it a nice four Ps, we drop the service, but I know a lot of what happens in agriculture is services, right? You mentioned summer camps, um, training, boarding, lessons, but also, you know, therapeutics, um, and, you know, agritourism, the, the beer and wine, local beer and wine industry is just exploding in this state. Um, and with the legalization of cannabis, we're starting to see like lounges and things pop up and that's all actually agriculturally related. Um, but yeah, so products and services, what you're going to make, how you're gonna package it, what it's gonna look like, what it's gonna feel like to your customer, your brand, the image that you project, your place strategies are dealing with how you actually distribute what you do. Maybe you have to invite people onto the property where you produce things, or maybe you have to take it to them, or maybe someone else takes it there for you. Price, you gotta think about willingness and ability to pay. And then promotion, uh, which we'll spend the second half of the evening focusing in on, are really strategies about 
how to make your customers aware of what you have available, how it's good for them, why they really need it in their lives, right? How they're gonna get it and maybe some incentives for them to jump in and become your customer. All right, so I've got one slide each for the four Ps, starting with product. So again, also service, but bear with me. Um, this is your output, right? It's something that you produce that hopefully nobody else produces exactly the same way, right? It's got some value added to it. Um, it's not an original raw commodity that we're dealing with when we're talking in this group, right? I like to call it that your product or your service is really, you're selling a set of satisfactions for someone. So what, is, what kind of need or want is it satisfying for your customers? Is it that they're looking for recreation? Is it that they're looking for you know, real skill development? Is it that they're looking for something delicious or just you know, having fun? Um, is it that they're looking for their basic needs, being able to eat on a budget? All these things are satisfying to different people in different ways because they have different needs, right? Different wants. So we want to establish a unique product or service. And typically, in a very competitive market, which agriculture is, there are lots of close substitutes available. So who's to say that they should buy your raspberry jam when the four tables down at the farmer's market, someone else has raspberry jam. But Americans really love to have a lot of choices. And if you just walk down like the Oreo aisle, um, the cookie aisle, and there's like 50 different flavors of Oreos these days, Americans love having a lot of choices and we have a very positive association with change and just new things. So this motivates us to continually develop new products or new services that we can offer on our farms. Price can be kind of the trickiest one to figure out to begin with. What are you gonna charge for your products or your services? But it's also the easiest aspect to change. You know, you could say, oh, these boarding prices really are not cutting it for us this year. We're gonna actually have to bump them a little bit. And it can be a little painful for everyone, but it's not as, you know, it's a lot easier to make that change than it is to like add additional acreage or um, decide that you're, gonna break into a new uh, grocery store chain or something like that. But basic economic principles tell us that the lower the price of something, the more people are going to buy of it. We're all looking for a deal, right? But things can be too cheap. Yes, you have a question? Yeah, something mentioned about the raising the price of like the board. Yeah. I'm a horse trainer. All right, horse trainer. So the, uh, I used to have uh, one of my credits would be like a grand for 30 days, but then this past year I had to bump it up to 250 bucks. But with that bump up, I actually felt like I could gain more customers. Ah. So gaining customers from an increase in price. Yeah, you know, gaining more customers because I feel like when people saw so he really has, you know, a level, a level, I don't want to say it with like expertise, but he, he has a bar set care on top of the training to where he thinks it's worth that. Yes. You know, I feel like, I feel like it kind of made people raise an eyebrow just a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, no, I love that. So raising the price can, can do a few things, right? You're conveying that you think you're services are worth more, that they're that valuable, that people should be willing to pay a higher price for them. And maybe there's also an element of, oh, prices are rising, they might rise other places, I wanna make sure I've got my spot. Um, yes, it's very scary to raise a price. <laughs> Yes. Um, 
There is a whole other discussion to have about the psychology of pricing. <laughs> if you, I'm sure everyone notices things like things aren't usually five dollars; they're four ninety-nine. There is extensive research in, you know, the approaches to pricing and and the psychological processes that people go through when they perceive changes in price or, um, and and there, you know, I don't want to call it tricks, but. <laughs> There are some tricks of the trade that generally really work, um, you know, like buy one, get one half off. Even if you didn't need to, you're going to get two because you think, oh, I'm really getting more value from this. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't need two pairs of ballet slipper shoes. I, just, <laughs> I only needed one, but boy, that deal. Oh, man, I just couldn't say no. So, but yes, I, I'd love to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but thank you for sharing that. It's, it's, it's a really good point that, um, that yes, there's, there are a lot of considerations that go into changing your price. I say it's the easiest aspect to change just because it's literally like changing a number somewhere, but it can be like emotionally the hardest and then have some really unexpected outcomes sometimes. Place is how our products or services actually reach our customers and our consumers through that marketing channel. And that marketing channel can be very, very, very long, right, for our Kraft macaroni and cheese, or it can be very, very, very short, where your customer literally comes onto your farm, maybe they're shopping at your on-farm market, maybe they're doing pick-your-own peaches, uh, or maybe they're boarding a horse and they're coming to you know, visit and get some riding time. Um, a lot of times that in agriculture especially, um, that chain is, is very, very short. In fact, it's not even a chain, really. <laughs> it's just a relationship between two people. Uh, but questions that we ask ourselves are, you know, what's really the nature of your product or service? Is it something where people really have to come to you and that's part of the experience? Or is it something that you actually don't ever want people coming on your property? You'd really rather meet them somewhere else, um, like going to a farmer's market or um, selling to restaurants or things like that. Yes. <laughs> Will the horse get on the trailer? <laughs> um, and if you have to work with people in between that in that marketing channel, some of those processors or wholesalers, you know, how do you actually connect with them? You can't just knock on the door of McCutcheon's and say, oh, hey, I have this, you know, tractor trailer full of apples that got hail damage. Here you go. No, there are like there's a contracting process that had to happen the year before for that kind of thing. So very, very lots of important questions here. Um, are you going to handle your own sales? Are you going to hire a broker or someone to do it for you? Do you have to physically move product? So do you have to put animals on a trailer? Or do you have to make sure that you are, uh, if you're selling frozen cuts of meat at a farmer's market, that you actually got them to that destination at the correct temperature, and then they stay at the correct temperature in coolers at the market the whole entire time, that it's you know August 17th and it's 98 degrees outside for six hours. So lots of... Lots of considerations. And then promotion, the communication of all these hopefully very positive aspects of you and your product or service, because especially these days, you are part of your product or service. It is, people want to know you, the producer, and you know, they, they want pictures of your home life and your children if that is something you're comfortable with with doing and showing who is this farm family. Um, we break promotion down into three different categories. Advertising is very non-personal usually. Uh, communication through mass media, maybe that's social media, maybe it's uh, other more traditional, older school types of advertising. Personal selling is when we're actually having a face-to-face -face communication with our potential customers. And I say face-to-face, -face, but a lot of personal selling these days actually isn't like two people physically together in a room, right? A lot of social media is personal selling. It feels like you're face-to-face -face and like you have a relationship with your, with your followers or your followers feel like they have a relationship with you, um, but you're not actually physically together. And then sales promotion 
our other usually non-personal strategies where we're offering you know, free samples, coupons, discounts to get people, you know, maybe it's a first timer discount to get people in the door and then hopefully get them up to paying full price um, and staying with you as a customer. So these four Ps lead us to two very important things that I will spend the rest of the semester talking about <laughs> if you want to come with me. Um, but tonight we'll just talk about them for a moment. The four Ps help you figure out who your target market is and they help you develop a brand. So the four Ps being your background research, right? But then when you have identified your target market and you're developing your brand, that's also going to lead you back to evaluating the four Ps and that marketing mix, and it's a continuous process. So when I say target market, I mean that the entire population of the United States or even the state of Maryland, they are not all your customers. They're not all your potential customers, right? Market segmentation is a process that we go through. It involves a lot of research um, where we actually divide out specific portions of potential customers, part of that total market, to really find a meaningful group of people that we can communicate with that are going to become, or at least hopefully a lot of them, are going to become your customers. We call this a target market, and you're probably going to have more than one. Your target market is the group of people, or maybe you don't sell directly to people, maybe you deal with other businesses. Um, and you design, implement, and maintain a marketing mix that is specifically for that group of people. So, for example, if I sell fruits and vegetables uh, and I'm doing that whole imperfect produce type thing, if everyone know what I'm talking about, imperfect produce or what is it, Hungry Harvest is another company. You know, it's like food rescue, diverting food waste from the waste stream and getting discounted foods at the same time. There are going to be different marketing mixes that I put together for trying to appeal to a mother of six who's on a very tight budget and is trying to get healthy meals on the table. Then I am going to market to like a single tech executive who thinks it's really trendy to be into diverting food waste. Right? They're, I'm going to reach them in very different ways with different messages. So those are two different target markets for an imperfect produce kind of company. The marketing mix also helps us develop our brand. So your brand, you're either creating one on purpose or you're creating one not on purpose, but you are creating a brand for yourself. Right, so let's be active about it. It's, it's your name, it's your business name, it's your uh, logo, a symbol, a design. Sometimes it's jingles, it, it's, it's all sorts of things that combine to really uh, create your business's identity. And to differentiate yourself from other people who do things that are very similar to you. So your brand identity is going to involve three main components. It's your name, it's your mark, and it's your image, which we could also call like the feel or the vibe of your company. And a lot of times people start with a name and then go to a logo, and then they stop and think, oh, what is the image that I'm really portraying and giving off here? Um, but maybe you want to start with the image first, in, in my opinion, the way I approach it. I think first about what is the feel of this particular product or service, or what is the feel of my general company at large, and then how am I going to convey that through the name and through um, the logo and, and through all of my promotional materials and through how I dress and how I present myself when I'm standing at the farmer's market or something like that. And you can update this over time, so you know all is not lost if you're like, oh, really should have thought about that logo more. <laughs> So let's compare and contrast a few real examples and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Um, so I have the four P's and the four C's here. Sorry, they're a little small um, for reading. And they come together to identify your target market. What do we see going on here with this product? So if you can't see very closely, it's, it's hummus, right? Garbanzo beans and tahini and different flavors. 
um, by the company Little Sesame. This is a local company. They're run out of, they're in DC. So what, what stands out to you first about who the target market might be for this product? Can we make any assumptions? Yes, okay, so maybe they're grown ups. <laughs> they're over the age of six. <laughs> okay, it's so a very big print. Calling it out. Classic hummus. Health conscious. Health conscious. Okay, so hummus is uh, fairly low fat, right? Flavorful. Doesn't have dairy in it for, you know, if anyone's lactose intolerant or vegan. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you think it's, what's the place or what's the convenience of this product? Yep. So it's, it's in a refrigerated case somewhere, right? It's, it's packaged in a, you know, maybe the amount you'd need for a week if you were a family of two or, or four. Um, I'll tell you, they actually just went nationwide in Whole Foods, this company. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and they are killing it on social media. You should follow Little Sesame just, for that, just to see their reels. And um, they started with two actual kind of fast casual type restaurants in DC. And then were so successful with selling packaged hummus that they closed their restaurants. And this is what they do now. So what's the sunny vibes add to that? It's got classic hummus, so you know what it is. Sweet hummus, Little Sesame. Sunny vibes is just like... Sunny Vibes Smooth Hummus, that's their tagline. Sunny Vibes Smooth Hummus, yes, it's a very feel-good company. You can see their logo is this little, so there's Little Sesame. They have the, the two words in a kind of funky font. It's like a little bit 70s, maybe, 60s, with the, also the other font that they're using. Um, and there's a little smiling sun in there. Um, yeah, so kind of happy, feel-good. Healthy kind of vibe. You know what? Sesame, I don't think sesame relates to hummus, but what? Well, it does actually. Tahini oh, is, is one of the main ingredients is made is of ground sesame seeds. Okay. I'm yeah. Chickpeas, yeah, chickpeas is the major ingredient, little but um, little chickpeas would also be cute, right? But little sesame. <laughs> because that guy's not yeah. the first thing. So it's yeah. Like, I'm wrong to it. It's like, well, why isn't that? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, however you read it, I think it, it feels kind of playful and fun. Um, I think of, I always think of open sesame, like, um, yeah, it's kind of it's a cute brand. I would call it a cute brand. Uh, okay, so this is like super, super branded, right? And has a pretty specific target market. It's in Whole Foods, so upper middle class, upper class shoppers, um, health conscious. What about broccoli? There's a target market for broccoli. <laughs> Big broccoli eater <laughs> in the back there. All right. But no, wait, think about it for a second. Heavily branded. Are we branded with broccoli? No, what is it about broccoli? Why isn't it branded? Part of the food groups. I think it's automatic for people. It's not healthy. Yeah, it's one of the So it's not processed, it's a very basic it food. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a bunch of broccoli growers, you can get together and say, hey, we're gonna market broccoli on the national or regional scale. Yes. Yes. So when it comes to more raw goods like this, which literally this is raw broccoli, right? Um, fresh, but it's a commodity. It's something that is like one of the most basic vegetables that we eat in this country, right? Um, there are a lot of opinions and sometimes you love broccoli, sometimes you hate broccoli. Sometimes your opinion of broccoli really changes if someone just cooks it right. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> Let me tell you, roasting, roasting broccoli, the way to go. I will never cook it any other way anymore. Um, 
But the thing is, broccoli has a much more generalized market, right? It's not super targeted because it doesn't make sense for broccoli to be super targeted. I can't make this head of broccoli so substantially different from the other head of broccoli over there that someone else grew that I'm going to invest a lot of time in curating a marketing mix and a brand and, and trying to target market. Well, yes, so there, yes, there is an important distinction, right, that you can, those are two different products. Organic broccoli and conventionally grown broccoli are two different products, right, um, that have a different target market. Um, but without getting into the organic, not organic discussion, um, broadly speaking, you don't see a lot of branding. It's, you know, it's kind of available everywhere place convenience, right? It's every grocery store, farmer's market, you know, as long as it's in season at the farmer's market. Um, and when it's not, you buy it frozen. You can buy it. Can you buy it canned? No. Mm, don't buy it canned. <laughs> um, yeah, generally expect a, kind of the same price across the board everywhere you go. Yes? It's yeah, so like you always see a brand if it's Florence or cut up or mm -hmm. something. If it's, it's processed. Yeah, we call that value added, right? It's processed in some way from its raw natural form. Um, so just to make a point that not all products and services really demand or require or deserve <laughs> the, uh, all the work we're talking about tonight. Um, and then, but to come back to your organic conventional discussion, there are cases where commodities like this can really be differentiated um, and then command that. So eggs, generally commodity product, right? But what about these eggs? So who's the target market for these eggs? Is there a target market for these eggs? Yes, so, so there is a target market, right? We've, it's worth having a marketing mix because this is a differentiated product, right? What makes it differentiated? Well, obviously the colors, yes. But what else makes it differentiated? The container, yes. Does it give a different feel, a different vibe, if you will, than a two by six carton? Yeah. It's funny how little things like that can actually make a huge difference. Um, I just, that's my part. <laughs> <laughs> this is our logo. This is our brand. Um, yeah, we do, we do the rainbow egg thing. And I'll tell you, people go nuts over this carton. And all it is is that it's three by four instead of two by six. How, long did, you, how did you come up with that? I mean, for an easy change like that, how long did that take you to say, let's try this shape? Oh, I tried it from the start. I never, went, I never did two by sixes. Did you see it somewhere else before? I saw it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Very yeah, and then it turns out you can buy all kinds of different egg cards. You can get hexagonal ones. You can get them in hot pink, hot yellow, blue. Um, and it's, you know, just those, those little things that people are like, ooh, that's a little different. I think I'll try that this time. All right, so I'll just wrap up um, very quickly because we need to go to snack time. Uh, but <clears throat> we all can relate to the unique, uniqueness of agriculture and you know we are really at the whims of nature right so the marketing and the work that we do in our marketing it, it almost feels like a lot more than say a toothbrush company that just has toothbrushes cranking out of these machines 24 hours a day 365 days a year nothing is changing about toothbrush production whereas we have seasonal considerations. Um, we have, you know, not just when can products be produced and sold, but, and, you know, when do people want to be out riding horses or shopping at the farmer's market or what have you, or, you know, going on lavender yoga excursions. Um, <clears throat> but what happens when a big storm comes up? <laughs> you know, you're, you're, Farmer's market sales might be great in the morning and then a storm blows in and pfft, nothing. Um, so it's, it's really challenging to you know, get those customers out, 
in the bad weather, to have them understand when things, the quality is different because of various biological factors. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of work to do and I applaud you all for it. Um, I'm gonna skip that last activity in the interest of snacks. <laughs> but uh, thank you for uh, having me here to speak tonight and I look forward to- Just one quick question. Yes. Snacks, um, we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is one, and maybe this is a whole other <clears throat> talk, but in the equine industry, because the margins are so tight, marketing, advertising, promotion often goes the way of a budget cut. Yes. So, is that a business plan to try to decide how to keep a portion of your budget dedicated to that? Because it always seems to be the first to go, and not just horse farms, but horse. Mm -hmm. Is that yes. something you talk about? In we could talk a lot about marketing budgets. <laughs> um, they are often the first thing to go because it's, you know, it's not the feed that's literally keeping your animals alive. Um, but I think <clears throat> these days, which I know I keep saying these days, uh, there are a lot of opportunities for high impact marketing that's very low that's budget. Technology itself, yeah. However, I will point out that it still takes a lot of time, human capital, creativity, you know, knowing that the best time to post an Instagram reel is actually at 3 a.m. on a Friday or something like that, which I probably got that wrong, but yeah. Um, <laughs> you see, I'm not up at 3 a.m. On a, on a Friday doing that. <laughs> um, but so, and I think that's a bit of a personal decision. You know, if, if you're not paying yourself for that time, um, at least not yet. Uh, but I'm hoping Molly has some nuggets of wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I think that marketing a little bit can go a very long way, but you might not necessarily be the right person to do that. Um, and that if you can throw a small budget at someone who's very professional with, yes, yes, that that, that can really be worth it. It can be something that is worth outsourcing from, you know, just you or just your family doing that work. Mm -hmm. in the long run <clears throat> for greater good, including the other talk about. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Yeah, I agree that it's often not the work that we want to do. We want to go out in the field. But if we can invest that time to do the market research and figure out, you know, how do I reach those customers most effectively, um, most efficiently when it comes to cost, that it saves a lot of time and a lot of money in the, wrong, in the long run. Yeah, but thank you all. Um, my business card's out here or come to the IAA, take a class uh, <laughs> if you would like to reach us further. Thank you.